my employer, like everyone else, has certain terms and conditions. They said, Mike, you must write a disclaimer. I said, what should it say? They said, we don't care. Just download one and make it say whatever you need it to say. What's important here is that regardless of what the disclaimer says, there's nothing that I will say that will mislead you. May the force be with you. Live long and prosper and good luck. You think about what we do and you realize, oh, this is incredibly important stuff. You know, processors, capacity, performance, applications, availability, all that stuff. And then you think, what's really, really important? This is my Uncle Sam. I mean, really had an Uncle Sam 60 some odd years ago, standing in front of his business that he founded almost a hundred years ago. His grandchildren, who are my cousins, still run this business and they'll still be running it in 1921, 100 years later. So you think what we're doing now, we'll be lucky if it's still here 10 years later because something will be replaced by something else, by something else, by something else. But 100 years, that's something to strive for. I learned from Marcy you should always have the word penguin in the title of your presentation. So thus the emperor strikes back. First, we'll discuss the Emperor really is a Z13. We'll talk about the V-switch technology that we have implemented on the Z13. Hypersockets bridges. Hypersockets and hypersocket bridges are two very, very different yet related things. We'll go over how that works. Live guest relocation. We have been such fans of live guest relocation. We'll talk about how we exploited LGR moving from the previous processor to the current processor. Then we'll go over after this experience, I want to talk about what I would like to see as the future of the technology, both the hypervisor ZVM and the hardware itself, that, no, we're not done yet. It's a journey. And then we'll briefly discuss the team that made this happen, because when you do a project like this, you, you get your focus on, okay, this is the technical stuff. These are the parameters and the definitions and the cables and all that, but really, it's a team, and a lot of times we don't necessarily give credit to the people that deserve it. I don't think Marcy mentioned this, but at any time, if you have a question, stop me and ask me, and I will do my guess to give you an answer. It will be a factual answer. It may not be a prompt answer. It may not be an answer today, but any answer I give you will be based on fact. I don't care if you come to Florida or not. That's your problem, not mine. The weather in Florida is always better than the weather in California. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Health Plan Services is a company that's been around in Florida almost 50 years. The focus that I work on at Health Plan is the business that we do to manage health care reform and the exchanges. This has really been a big, big topic the last few months in U.S. news, culture, politics, and all that stuff, and you're going to continue to hear more about it. Now, what I'm telling you is the reality behind it. I have a few slides I did a couple of days ago talking about how we actually manage our way through the Affordable Care Act. And by the way, if you wish, now it's a little bit too late now, but if you wish to talk to me about the politics, about all this, about the Affordable Care Act and red states, blue states, all that stuff, I have two words for you, gray goose. As long as you're buying, I am talking. The emperor really is a Z13. I'm going to tell you stuff you already know. Here's how we got where we're going. This system back in 2013, which is only four years ago, was six IFLs, well under 10,000 IFL equivalent MIPS. The summer of that year, we grew a little bit to still under 10, fewer than 10 IFLs. Continued to grow through 2014, because each year we do an open enrollment cycle, through since 2014 again. 2015, and then last year we added the sufficient capacity we're talking about today. If you do the math, from where we are four years ago to today, it's 1,300% growth in capacity. I've been doing a lot of things for a lot of years, but I don't know that I've ever seen anything that grew 1,300% in four years. And that was, it has been and continues to be a big, big part of the challenge of what we do with the reforms and the exchange systems is staying on top of that kind of growth. If you do the math, you order a Z13 that's capable of running ZVM or ZOS, 
you pay a lot of money. If you order the Linux one, which is Linux only, is capable of running only Linux on Z, has of course the obligatory gold stripe, you still pay a lot of money, but just not near as much when they put that decal on there. If you ever study IBM, Watson Sr. started off in the 19th century. He had a job selling pianos out of the back of a horse-drawn cart. So he would go to a farmer's house, and first he would convince the farmer, hey, I'm, I'm Tom Watson, I'd like to sell you this piano. Oh, I need no piano. Yes, you do. So Tom would convince the farmer to help him and get the farmer's boys out there unload the piano into the farmer's parlor. Then Watson, who could play the piano and could sing, would entertain the family for several hours, playing the piano, blah, 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 just having a good time with the family. Then it started to get dark, and Watson would say, you know, folks, we've had a really good time here. It's going to be a hassle to load this piano back into my cart. Why don't we set up some terms? And when you think about it, a century and a half later, IBM is still pretty much the same company. Just not selling cart, pianos out of the back of a cart. Here's the scope of work that we had to do at HPS. We've had the EC12 for a few years now, accumulated our workload on it, which includes four VM images on our cluster plus a ZOS workload. The idea is we would implement the Emperor, the Z13, and take that Linux on Z, the ZVM workload, and move it from the EC12 to the Z13. Now, the ZOS workload was not going anywhere, so we had to maintain all the connectivity that we require from the new environment to the old environment. In fact, we've actually left a fraction, I guess a, a large fraction, of our de development workload sitting on the EC12, moving only the production workload. We did actually experiment quite a bit with the testing and the prototyping, moving the non-production workload back and forth before we figured out how to do the production workload. I had a personal and professional challenge with this. Like I said, we've been exploiting live guest relocation and SSI for several years now. And I said, guys, what if we could get from point A to point B moving all this production workload without an outage? A few months ago, I was sending an email and I had a typo that I inadvertently entered into the word outage, but yet it applies. No outrage. <laughs> well, apparently a word, if it's an English word, spell check doesn't stop you from using it. First thing we realize is that the Z13, very, very different when it comes to the function that you can you have access to with a global shared link aggregate control program vSwitch. And we said, you know, rather than just moving the workload from one place to the other, let us exploit the qualities of the new hardware as we move the workload. So the first thing was the vSwitch. You've seen this in somebody else's slide before. If you, if you need information about what it takes to support technology and you're looking to me, don't. You, you, you should re rethink your life. I'm not going to give you PTF numbers, but the idea is, yeah, we had to do some work to get the Z13 and then to get ZVM 6.3 ready for the link aggregation. In the old system, I have a picture here, makes it easier to see, we have all the discrete adapters so that each system had a couple of discrete, discrete virtual switch adapters to prevail over. The new system will have the shared open system adapter network and shared OSIS. The diagram makes it look a lot easier than it actually is because it inverts, it, it, it includes another little piece that I was not aware of. Then the idea is, this is not in the same ops SSI cluster obviously, you can add more systems to that same shared network and also add more adapters to that same network so it gives you a, an element of scale that you never had over here. Then they brought this thing into my life called the IVL. I forgot what the acronym is because I struggled with it so dearly. I like to think that, as Marcy was saying, I've been doing this a while and that I can read the book and figure things out. IVL was one of the more challenging things. I thought I, I had a hard time figuring out Microsoft Project until I started working with the IVL. 
Apparently the IVL is a virtual switch to control a virtual switch. So, okay. There's no real wires in it, it's all just, just connections to the same network port. And we called it vSwitch Zero. So it's a communication infrastructure to exchange control information. That's the magic words. Manage your global networking when you have multiple systems on the same processor. So you set up a whole nother virtual switch here, which is this is the, the symbol for the controller that we will continue to use today to manage the other virtual switch. So the idea is you create the IVL on the first member, build it and test it on the second member. Build the OSA group on the first member, which is the cluster of, of OSAs for your vSwitch. Build it on the second member. So now at this point, you have the IVL controller in place and you have the, the OSA group. You have those, those hardware devices, the, the, I, the adapters grouped together. And then you build the virtual switch, which actually exploits all that. I learned a long time ago that baby steps work much better. You get one thing to work and then you continue to build upon that and build upon that. Then you add next member, next member, and so on. So you have the controller, the adapters, and the switch. You build upon one. I'm going to show you the code that supports this, not because I expect you to remember it. Like I said, if you're looking to me for configuration information, you have deeper problems in your life. You have to define this where you define the IVL, that's all brand new. Then of course you define the global shared group of adapters, physical devices. And then you come in here and you define the vSwitch which uses the information above. This is one, two, three, four statements inside system config. I'm not sure why, but it took me an entire week to figure this out. Why is that? You look at something and you say, okay, I've read the book, I know how to follow the instructions. And then when you go move forward to actually do it, it's an awful lot of things that you learn the hard way. I'm not sure why that is, but this was a case of, is it really this difficult? Once I figured it out, it worked and I was unable to break it. So it did in fact work. If you look at the new things, there's a type IVL, an IVL port, so there's actually new information on the return from these commands. Is anybody here other than us using that yet? Okay. So maybe you can add to it when I get... You sure? Okay. Because I can have you come sit up here like you did a couple of days ago. You know. Am I making you... I'm, I'm sorry. Am I, am I making you nervous? Okay. All right. Once again, you look at it, and you can see it's a global vSwitch as opposed to a local vSwitch. You've got an active controller that manages it, and then there's a backup controller somewhere. And that's what it ends up looking like. You've got the controller in place, you have the physical hardware connection in place, and you have the vSwitch in place, and it all worked. So that was one network done. Now we move on to the HyperSockets bridged network. This was also somewhat interesting. The idea with hypersockets is you have that, that connection, that bus inside the, the keck that is managed partially by the hardware and, and exploited by the software, gives you the ability to connect from systems on the existing box at what is a higher level of bandwidth and capacity. The idea is with the hypersockets bridge, you have a hypersocket over here and a hypersocket over here, and they talk to each other. I said, well, that sounds pretty easy. But you also have to have a hypersocket talking to ZOS because I'll show you in a few slides here. Once you make this transition, ZOS doesn't play that game anymore. When you have say half your system over here, half your system over here. They continue to communicate over the same addresses, over the same interfaces, interfaces on each server. However, it doesn't know or doesn't care whether that server is over here or over here. So this is how it could realistically look when you have ZOS and some of your ZVM infrastructure over here and the rest of your ZVM infrastructure over here. All right, we're 25% we're into it now. We've had zero questions. 
I'm going to assign someone to ask a question here if we don't have any. Oh, Marcia, oh, oh, oh she moved. Maggie moves, therefore, Maggie moves, so she has to ask a question. Write one down for her, Brian. As everything in life, whether it's work or relationships or parenting or whatever, it's not as easy as it sounds. Once again, my life is, is I try to use analogies as much as I can, and this is the TCPIP stack. This is as much as I know about it, that the old hypersocket network was TCPIP layer 3, supported both by ZVM and ZOS, all great inside one processor. Well, guess what? If you're going to do HyperSockets Bridge, there is a catch. There are many catches. The first catch we came across was that you have to convert your HyperSockets from layer 3 to layer 2. And the extra exciting part of the catch is ZOS no longer communicates on the layer 2 HyperSocket. ZOS only talks layer 3. So if you're going to talk to continue to talk to ZOS, you have to do even more work. Make it even more fun, each server that you transition over, when the server goes from layer 2 to layer 3 hypersockets, the server has to take that interface down, make the configuration changes, and then restart that interface on the hardware level, on the server level, which guess what means? Another outrage. So how do we do that? How do we accomplish that to make it work? And give, remember, we do it on our, our non-production systems first to make sure that we know what we're doing. So we're talking, well, I don't know, several hundred servers to try to do this inside what you will later learn. It's a very short period of time. So on each server, shut down the hypersocket interfaces. On each server, physically detach, well, I guess that they're virtual devices, but detach the hypersocket addresses from each server. So now you have each server unable to connect over that network. So if any servers are relying on that network and they can't fail over to the other, the vSwitch network, those servers may have some challenges. Take all those devices that you just attached, make them offline. Then change the hardware so that the definitions for those devices are now layer 2. Vary those devices back online, attach all those devices, and then into Linux, start each device. What do you think is the key to doing this for hundreds of servers in a very short period of time? Rich actually breathed, so he has to answer that question. Automation. Automation is planned laziness. So yes, we had that level of automation, made all that happen. Automation both in ZVM and in Linux. So it required the kind of some cross-team collaboration. So this is what the net network starts to look like after you make that layer 2 change. Remember, ZOS is not going to play on layer 2. So therefore, ZOS needs another physical adapter. ZVM is going to need another physical adapter for the bridge so that these servers that are still here on the same box, because remember, they're a layer two now, if they want to talk to ZOS, they have to use the OSA. It's got to go out and back in. Although we found what I believe to be somewhere between cheating and a loophole and a common sense approach was, why don't we do this? Why don't we have them share the device, or the pair of devices for failover, so that way, the layer 2 hypersocket can then talk to ZOS over a shared layer 2 OSA. This was kind of fun when I figured this out. This was like, oh, something actually worked like I thought it would. So this is the infrastructure now on the EC2. Remember, we're doing all this on a processor that we're effectively going to abandon except for ZOS. I mean, all this work just so we can establish the connectivity between where we're from and where we're going. Then we prototype it. We take one of these images off, move that image over here, and yes, we can connect across the bridge, which is a physical adapter 
from this hypersockets to this hypersockets. If it's talking to ZVM system, it goes through the hypersockets bridge. If it's talking to ZOS, it simply goes straight through the adapter. And then you realize, oh, you're not done. Something about jumbo frame sizes. Like I said, I'm not a TCP IP person. I learn the minimum amount that I need to to be successful. But the idea with all of IT is if you can make your problem someone else's problem and have them solve it. So in this case, worked with the network guys and the Linux guys. They said, well, our MTU size is 9,000. We like that. However, the default MTU size for the bridge was less than 9,000 bytes. So when the jumbo frames tried to traverse the network, a challenge. So then we have to convert to jumbo frames. Well, guess what? It's exactly the same steps, exactly the same outage, exactly the same outrage as converting to HyperSockets Bridge in the first place. Fortunately, as Rick mentioned, the automation was already in place to make all this somewhat easier to do. We did, however, take good notes. Since we did all this twice on the non-production system, we said, okay, when we go to our, our production images and our production Linux servers to make this happen, we will do it all together at the same time. Like you learned and from your, your shop teacher in eighth grade shop, measure twice, you know, cut once, the guy with three fingers missing. Then we thought, well, we've, we've got it figured out. We've got the jumbo frames flowing across here. We've got our hypersocket bridge. We've got ZOS participating. We've got a VM system over there. And guess what? More failure. This takes a little bit more time to figure this one out. It turns out our network is really not a network. It's really a bunch of devices that the network teams have acquired over the years and cobbled together internally. And somehow when they did that, one of their links between device Charlie and device Foxtrot didn't talk to each other when you put the jumbo frames through them. They had like a very small pipe trying to move the big data through it. So once again, we were having jumbo frames. Fortunately, the network guys figured that out. They put it all back together, but another lesson learned. I had to code this, uh, once again, just showing you this to show you that the, this definition, it looks like a very small amount of code, but it probably took a week to write. So you figure out which, which image you're on, define a, a bridge address, which is the, the OSA that connects you to the outside. And then you have a bridge port, which connects your bridge to your network, define all those things. And then, yeah, it all works. So you end up having a new vSwitch, vSwitch 3. Remember, vSwitch 0 is the IVL, the controller. vSwitch 1 is what actually is the 10 or the OSA link aggregate switch. And then vSwitch 3, oh, did I skip one? I'm sorry. vSwitch 3 is the switch that connects the hypersocket bridges together. You go through here, you display your hypersocket bridges ready. This is really pretty boring stuff, so we're going to go through it pretty fast. Those are your real addresses. There's also a secondary controller, a different VM system that controls the bridge when the first one fails, called standby. Remember, the previous one was 13. This is system 10. And sure enough, it works. We actually tried it. So you've got the bridge going through system Charlie here, and then we introduce some sort of failure, like shutting down system Charlie, Rather than leaving Alpha and Bravo in the dark, the V-switch and the bridge figure out, oh, Charlie is down. We will then move to Bravo, and now Bravo will manage the bridge instead of Charlie. And we, we tested that, and it actually worked. That's the nice thing when you have an environment that is lower expectations. You can test stuff like failovers. Then we were able to enjoy, I call it the Big Mac surprise. This is still to this day a topic of conversation between us at HPS and segments of our IBM team. For simplification here, I've got a Linux server that's on system A, which is on the processor on the left. To simplify things, we'll just say that the MAC address is 223344. 
I realize that they're longer than that, but it makes life easier. So this server was started on system A. It has these three OSA devices, the hypersocket devices, this MAC address. So then we use the guest relocation to move that server over here to system delta. When we use live guest relocation, of course it gets a different adapter address because the addresses over here don't have to be the same, but it carries with it the same MAC address. We didn't think that was going to be a problem. It's Apparently this is a, a characteristic of the way live guest relocation works. One of the things that we have in place that Rich had mentioned is automation. So when we create a new server, that server is given the next available OSA address. That way we don't have to code the hypersocket addresses. The automation attaches the hypersocket addresses. So the Linux guy came over here because remember in the time that we are migrating this system, we're also growing it adding new servers. Like I said, I showed you on the early slides there, we were in the midst of that 1,300% growth over three years. Yeah, we grow the IFLs, grow the capacity, and then we grow the number of servers to fill up that capacity. So yeah, we're not stopping the world to do processor migration. We're also doing growth and deploying of servers. So the Linux guy deploys a new server over here on system A, because it uses that range of HyperSockets address, guess what that server gets? The same MAC address. We call this, what do we call this, Rich? We call it, um, he knows the word, he just can't think of it. Sir? Disappointment. <laughs> what was especially disappointing about this was what I didn't detect it. The Linux guy, once he figured all this out, or once he figured out there was disappointment, he went to the next level to figure out why there was disappointment. And then, of course, he enjoyed communicating his level of disappointment to me. So I had to figure out, okay, what is a workaround to make that stop? So what I would do now is after I do the LGR, I would simply vary those devices offline. Part of our communication with IBM is to figure out what is a better way to do this. You can see now it's got 55, and we'll talk about that later. But that was, once again, you start something, and you know where you're going, but you don't know what you're going to come across when you get there. So we've, we've got the stuff set up now. The Z13 is integrated. You know, we took the, we took the piano off of the back of the horse-drawn carriage. We installed the piano. We're playing the piano but we haven't started actually putting the, the production workload. We want to use live guest relocation to do that. Using that live guest relocation, we're going to focus on exploiting the link aggregate vSwitch, the, the aggregate that I showed you with the IVL that controls it. We're also going to exploit the HyperSockets bridge so as the servers move from one processor to the other, they can still communicate with each other and they can still communicate with ZOS because ZOS continues to stay on the EC12. We have all that ready, all the prism definitions, the, the, the hypervisor, the hardware hypervisor is ready. Now we're talking, we can begin the actual live guest relocation. We have each server has to move from point A, from server, from the old keck to the new keck without an outage. That's the goal. We only have four images in our single system image cluster because that's the limit. Each SSI image of ZVM runs in an LPAR. But we've got 100 servers to move, so we invented the LEGO method. So this is how we're going to step stool our way through this. Previously, using LGR, it was pretty simple, the stuff that you've been reading out of the books for years now. Say we want to do something disruptive to image D, but not disruptive to these servers. Take the images, or take the servers, move them from image delta back up to image Charlie. Do something disruptive to image delta, like put on PTFs, IPL it, whatever. And then we take the same servers or different servers and put them back.
This is, of course, what textbook live guest relocation is all about. The idea is you can move the workload back and forth, A, B, C, D, whatever, and continue to run the servers. But you have to implement the dirty little secret of SSI in the background, at least from our perspective, and that is, of course, the link connections, the IS link connections that define the connectivity from each server to another, to the next. Each statement is required so that each ZVM image has to have a direct link to every other ZVM image. Now think about this, over those, those channel adapters, you've got A, B, C, and D. A has to be able to talk to B, C, and D. B has to be able to talk to D, C, and A, so on and so forth, so that they all talk to each other. However, now you introduce the challenge that, okay, we've got the old processor, then you have the new processor, A, B, C, and D, and then now each of those members has to be able to talk to, so for instance, all the A images on both the old processor and the new processor, whether it's running in either LPAR, has to be able to talk to B, C, or D, regardless of whether B, C, or D is on the new processor or the old processor. So you see where I'm going with this. A, B, C, D is over here. So we have the definition. This definition has been in place literally for years. Then on the new processor, we have the same definitions, the parallel definitions. However, guess what? All right, Rich, give me, give me a hint. What's the word here? Ugly. Marcy says it's a mess. Rich says it's spaghetti. We just call it ugly, but yes, you are correct. <laughs> and, and Alan is correct. The elegance is that it works. He is, he is completely correct there. And some people have made a point to me, said, Mike, you're being a whiny little baby. You only do the definitions once, and then they work forever. I realize that, but if they're sufficiently complex, it's still somewhat of a challenge and an ugly mess to do it once. Okay. Are we ready to do live guest relocation? Remember, we did the vSwitch. We did the HyperSockets bridge. Now we've done the connectivity for the two processors, the images to talk to each other. So really, when you get down to it, all we've done now is networking. Three different kinds of networking, but yeah, all we've spent our entire journey up to this point is setting up the network. Now we think we can actually do the work because we have these three networks in place, the vSwitch, the bridge, and the OSA links, the channel-to-channel -channel links. Let's see how this is going to work. Of course, you want to test everything with a volatile system that works. So once again, classic live guest relocation. We take image D and make it empty completely void of servers. Put an end to image D over here, an IPL image D over here. All that connectivity that I've been talking about for the last 35 minutes has to be in place, and then you can actually move those servers without interruption from image C to image D using live guest relocation. Then you continue to play that same game. Shut down C over here, bring up C over here. Move the servers that belong on C back to C. Yeah, we have a, a, a rhyme or reasons to which servers go where, but that's beyond the scope of where we're at today. We still have servers here on A and B, so let's, let's try this now, guys. Let's make D a lot bigger. And then we start moving over servers from A and B over to D, and roll them all over, roll them all over. Then you see the math, and then you put them back where they belong. Of course, I can show this to you in, in 100 or so seconds of animation, but you can imagine takes a whole lot longer than 100 seconds for all this to work. But when you are here, you have effectively done the live guest relocation from here to here 
without an outage and hopefully without an outrage. I think I'm going to quote. Do I need to put quote? Do, Alan, do I need to put quotes around this? You sure? Because I'll, I'll, I'll put an asterisk and I'll put your name at the bottom. Okay. Okay. Just, just checking. Because now you know where I heard that. We go to our change control people and say, okay, I am going to use live relocation to move my servers from the EC12 to the Z13. They said, well, you have to do that in the outage window. I said, what, didn't you hear the word live? Didn't you see my lips move when I said live? They said, no, no, you must do that during the outage window. I said, but, 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 but. They said, no. I said, this is, they said, are you sure? And they said, yes, you must complete during the outage window. I said, but, but read my lips. It's live, not an outage. And, and, and they said, oh, nope. It must be done during the outage window, which is a very finite. Are you gone? Good luck. See you later. It's a very finite amount of time in between this hour and this hour to do this. So finally, my, of course, my comment was, you know, whatever. So the schedule is here. We've tested the live relocation, which, of course, is fundamentally based on the three networks that we set up. Now it's time to go with it. You wonder why library relocation takes more than 100 seconds. It's pretty simple. The gift of paging. And intuitively, this is pretty easy to understand. I'm simply visualizing it, showing you what it looks like. We have a server that we're going to move. It doesn't make a difference whether it's A to B or B to A. I believe the server must be running on A. So the server is running here, and this particular image has a steady state of very low pages per second. And then right here, we initiate the source here on A. So we start paging in. And then our target system, you can see it's a different color. We start paging out over here because those, those blocks from that server have to come somewhere. Now Bill says, where's Bill here? Where's, where's Bill? So I guess this is that idea that we're going to page out ahead of time because we can. Is that part of what's going on here? Yeah, that's part of it. So we didn't. This was, we expected this to work this way. But the idea is, is that adds time, makes it not terribly instantaneous. One of the reasons that we chose to move from the older technology to the newer technology, when you acquire the Linux One, you get, can I say this word, buttload? Buttload more memory. So you have a lot more memory on the target system, which means you're probably memory constrained on the source system which makes this take even longer. Eventually, the paging stops when you're done. This happened to be from 1555 to 1607, right at 12 minutes worth of work. Let's do the math and figure out if you get 100 servers, each one takes 12 minutes. That could take a while. Then we figured out during this move process, time she was not our friend. We moved about two-thirds of the servers doing this with live guest relocation, had zero problems, zero errors doing it. We wrote our script, followed our script of moving ZVM images over, moving servers over, worked, 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 worked. But then because of that gift of paging, we realized that time was running out. Remember that finite window that said, okay, you got to start after the window opens and finish before the windows close. And we said, heck with it. We'll use dead guest relocation for the rest of the servers. So we did use mostly live guest relocation. And we proved we could have continued to use it, but we were about to turn into a pumpkin and needed to make it happen. But in reality, we did it. ZEC12 was devoid of production Linux servers. All the servers ended up on the Linux one, the Z13, exploiting both the, the global vSwitch, HyperSocket Bridge, live guest relocation, and all that network stuff that we did to connect all that. So we did it. Then we look at, okay, we've got this system running. If, if I'm not going to talk about what we're going to do in the future, you know, why bother? We realize that if you have all the servers over here, then you have this particular device as a single point of failure. And how do we know that device is a single point of failure? Because occasionally it failed. We were able to create a problem that up to that point they were unaware of. This is really a fascinating problem, I thought. 
Somewhere in PRISM, it lost the pointers to the free memory on the Linux One. So when I IPL'd a completely unrelated, I think I was IPLing a standalone restore program in a different LPAR, it shut down the entire Z13 for a few minutes. And we thought, well, that's kind of disappointing. What we did figure out is it, it made it very clear to us that yes, even though this is a highly available device, it's still built and designed and managed and maintained by humans, which were inherently unreliable devices. So we thought, okay, moving forward, someday it would be nice to have, doesn't need to be another EC12, but some equally as capable processor over here so that if either one of these fails, now this is what Marcy's been talking about in her slides for a decade now, the fact that she has this kind of thing. So she's proven it works. We just have to be able to do it. And the same thing for ZOS, because ZOS only runs on one processor, but ZOS is not my problem, so I just don't care. I mean, I, I care that it runs, but I don't care to fix it. Of course, we're going to have to deal with this ZVM64 stuff, make sure that all this works with ZVM64. And, you know, oh, by the way, maybe we can have fewer ZVM images with more exploitation of CPU pooling. I can tell you the APAR numbers for CPU pooling, but once again, if you're using me for the source of your APAR numbers, you have bigger problems in your life. I, after going through all this, I realized, you know, there are some things that need to change in the technology to make my life easier and better. Of course, it's all about me. We know that. To make my life easier, my quality of life better, and to make the quality of service of all this stuff work better. So I call this my wishing well list. If you've been in any of the IBM discussions all week, this number four keeps coming up. Actually, the, the, the number that keeps coming up is simply greater than four. The idea is that at some point, IBM will give us a supported, documented, tested management path so that the SSI cluster, so I don't want to play that shell game. Because you can see from my example, if our SSI cluster could have been greater than four members, I would have had half as much work to do because I would have had to move my servers once instead of twice. Remember, doing all that moving, each server had to move somewhere to empty the VM image that that server was running on and then move over to the new box and then move back to the image it came to. Some of the servers moved three times. Even though the server stayed up the whole time, many of my servers had to move twice and some of them had to move three times. Had the cluster been bigger than four members, I wouldn't have had to play that game. Live and learn. ZOS does, what, 32? So surely we can, we can beat four. I understand that that's a, a futures thing, so I would invite you to stay tuned, keep coming to share, keep listening to what IBM has to say about this. So perhaps this time next year we might have a better story about that. I don't know. You know, I learned HCD some number of years ago on ZOS because I had to. Then I realized, gosh, this is like trying to carve your I.O. definition in stone. It is that exquisitely painful. Even with the Linux One, we're still dependent upon this. We did a lot of conversing with our IBM support team, our local team, and our extended team. And they said, okay, Mike, here's your best bet. Continue to use the ZOS processes to build your definitions. When those definitions are ready, you copy those definitions from the EC12 over to the Linux One, and then you implement, dynamically usually, those definitions on the Linux One. When I watched that process happen, I realized, oh, this just hurts. It's just painful. And of course, IBM does have a solution for that, the DPM, but apparently that is not available to me anytime soon because we use count key data. The HyperSockets MAC address scenario thing, so that was kind of embarrassing, the big Mac surprise, because the Linux guys pointed out that failure to me. I did not detect it on my own. 
And then, of course, I had to convince IBM that it was their problem. And the hardware guys said it's a software problem. The software guys said it was a hardware problem. Eventually, they said, no, no, it's, it's Mike's problem. They said, OK, here's what you're going to do, Mike. You're going to create, create these equivalency IDs on each of your VM images so that the equivalency ID, in my case, will match the name of the server. So when the server moves with live guest relocation from one image to another, it will always use its own private device addresses rather than using a pool of shared device addresses. I haven't actually finished that yet. I prototyped it. It's going to be, once again, just, just a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of automation to figure out, set up, and get it to work. As I've mentioned a couple of times up to this point, it took a substantial team to make this happen. Everyone in here has probably done some sort of a migration or implementation. And you don't realize the quality and the variety of the team members until you start doing this. And I want to make it very clear to you all that, that I appreciate all the work that this extended team has helped me do to make that work. In fact, greater than zero people on this team are actually in this room today. At HPS, we had our IBM business partner team to help us scope this out to make sure it was all feasible, that quality assurance thing. The ZOS team had to come to bat over and over again because especially affecting the network way we work with ZOS. As I mentioned before, our network team were the guys that were on top of this. Every time we asked for something, they did it. It might take a while, but they did it. Our Linux team, we, we, drove, we, we drew through the knot hole over and over again on this journey with us, and they survived. Our operations team had some significant work getting the hardware and the physical planning and all that stuff. Our DBAs and our, do I have them here? Our middleware team, wherever they are, developers, middleware team, were pretty critical people helping us test all this stuff because we have the idea that when you're doing all this experimentation in your non-production environments, you have to test it. Remember we talked about there was a couple of problems with networking, one of them with the duplicate addresses and another problem with the networking with the large frames and all that stuff, the jumbo frame support and then the, the stuff getting through the network. That was actually detected during our testing from the middleware teams, the DBA teams, and the developers. Had those guys not been on top of it to help us test all that stuff, we could very easily have gone into production with that exposure. But because those guys were able to commit the time and give us the help to make that happen, we were able to get through that, learn the lesson the easy way in the non-production system, rather than learning it the hard way in the production cluster. IBM Lab Services, thank you again, Alan, for all your efforts. Appreciate that. We also had a lot of help from our IBM hardware guy, the guy that I think there's only one of in Florida now. I don't know, maybe two now, I don't know. We, we, don't, we see them as much as we can. But once again, this was the team. This was the group of folks that, that helped us make all this happen. And I, I appreciate their help. Like I say, some of them are here, some of them are not. So we actually talked about all this. We, we introduced the Emperor, the global LACP virtual switch with that IVL thing, the HyperSockets bridges, which was a lot of fun, the mostly live guest relocation. One of, the, one of the takeaways that we got from this now is when we proved that we could do live guest relocation without an outage to the servers, now our change control team says, yeah, that's OK to do outside the change window. Even though they were reluctant to allow us to do it the first time during the change window, they said, oh, it's OK now. So we did have that takeaway as well, too, from our change management team, is that, like everybody else, you have to show them how it works, and then they think it's, maybe it's their idea. And then finally, of course, I'm not doing all this together. You guys have been way too silent here. It's time for you to start standing up and raising your hand and asking some. There's Romney. He's Rom Romney. He's moving. He's thinking about a question. He just doesn't know what his question is yet. Rich, give him a question there. Yes, ma'am. Marcy has asked the question, why do we use hypersockets? What does that buy us? The decision to use the hypersockets predates my participation in this, in this system. But the original thought with the hypersockets is, is that, that there's higher bandwidth in between the Linux servers. However, I believe that hypersockets is kind of like that episode of Happy Days where Fonzie jumped the shark 
and Happy Days was disappointing after that. I, I firmly believe, or I personally believe, that hypersockets have jumped the shark, but the quantity of changes that we would have to do to make this Linux servers get off the hypersockets and move exclusively over to the global shared LACP would be another outage and another outrage. Not right now, no. She asked her question, do we run backups over to ZOS? Not currently. We are looking at, further down the road, doing our own TSM or storage spectrum protect. Is that it? It used to be TSM spectrum protect. We are considering doing our own spectrum protect backups to ZVM inside our image. And in that case, that data would move over the hypersockets. So they may stay in place for something like that. Yes, sir. And we would be able to do that. However, we have yet to integrate the two HMCs with each other. That's uh, another to-do list thing that I failed to mention. But uh, yeah, because our environment, oh, he asked about moving stuff from, the HM, from one processor to the other going through the HMC. But the challenge that we have here is that when you touch a production asset with a non-production issue like doing the testing and deployment, they said the HMCs have to stay separate for the time being. Now we just haven't gone back and done the pickup work to bring the HMCs into the same network. But you're right, Dennis, that we will we'll hopefully be able to do that once we get the HMCs integrated into the same network for both, uh, both CACs. Answer your question? Yes, sir. The Alan's question was we move the, the images around for, or move the servers around from image to images and how does this affect our service level agreements with our clients? One of the things, the, the carryovers that we have from several years ago is that our, our current LPAR configuration is based entirely on licenses. We have the A system for Web3 application server, the B system for MQ servers, and the C and D system for LUW servers. So what we're able to, to do with that in the case of LUW, which is where we've seen a lot of this, is move the LUW servers from one image to another, bounce that image, and then move them back, like I showed on the previous slide. But our carriers generally are not, unless they read our change control records, which they have access to, are not particularly involved at that level. Their requirements are more about availability and not necessarily locality of what we run. So. As long as LGR works, moving a server from one place to another, we continue to maintain the availability and their, their issue about where it physically resides is not near as important as the fact that it's up and it has a sufficient capacity. No, we don't. We just, I think the agreement was it will run in Florida. Because <laughs> it's warmer there, exactly, yes. Yeah. So, there's, there's Brian, he's been too silent. Brian has something to offer here. What does he have to offer? He's, he's disappointed because I didn't mention the VM Manager stuff, but VM Manager played a part in this. I simply didn't put it on the slide, especially during the live guest relocation stuff because we actually use VM Manager to tell which, uh, which images are on where. We use VM Manager. Yes, sir. It's running ZOS plus our non-production Linux on Z workload. That was his question, are we running purely ZOS? No, it's, we, we, we didn't abandon all the ZVM workload, just the non-production workload. What's gonna happen is, if, his question was, if we, if we continue on the growth curve, what are we gonna do? If we continue on the growth curve, we will simply make the, the emperor bigger. Yeah, using more IFLs, more memory, more ZVM licenses, more LPARs probably, yes. Marcy brought up a very good point about more LPARs. The idea that if we can continue to expand the SSI someday, hopefully past that four members, then we'll be able to have more members over there, which makes the, the relocation stuff that Alan was talking about even simpler, 
because we have more places to put things. But the idea with growth is we create, uh, we, we make the emperor bigger and then add more logical processors to the VM images and then add more servers or bigger servers. The growth that we have seen typically to add another carrier to our system is simply to create a whole new set of servers for that carrier. And for this particular environment, that scales pretty well. Because at that point, if you add, say we pick up, I don't know, Pink Cross, if you add Pink Cross to our system, that adds a few hundred servers, or maybe a few dozen servers, depending upon the environments, then we just make the LPARs where those servers run that much larger with more memory and more IFLs. Anything else? Rich is moving again. He's still awake at least. Yes, sir, Rich. Say that again, sir. How are the drum lessons coming along? Effectively with the drum lessons, what I find that to be an alternative to the treadmill right now. If I don't want to play on the treadmill, if I don't want to stomp on the treadmill for an hour, I put my earphones on and go hit things. What I have found is I, in fact, my wife commented one time, she said, you know, when you practice the drums, you don't sound near as bad as you used to. I guess that was a compliment. Anyway, we obviously have to have a quote, and I found a quote that completely describes the situation here. The obscure we see eventually. It takes a little longer for us to understand the completely obvious. And that was my experience here. The obscure stuff, I worked and worked and worked and worked to make the obscure stuff work the completely obvious stuff right over my head. Thanks again for your time, folks. Fill out your evaluation. Good day and good luck. Because we're